Cyber criminals are using social engineering loaded with urgency and fear to successfully prey on victims, your employees, or your customers. Protect your Office 365 email from today's most sophisticated attacks with Barracuda Email Threat Scanner. It's a free tool to help protect your business from these hard to detect attacks. The Barracuda Email Threat Scanner uses artificial intelligence to hunt and eliminate Office 365 email threats. Find the cybersecurity threats hiding in your Office 365 email right now. Get your free email threat scan at securityweekly.com forward slash Barracuda. Keeping up with security issues across thousands of web assets without the right approach to web application security is a daunting task. Get ahead with web vulnerability scanning automation from NetSparker, a leader in dynamic and interactive application security testing known for its ease of use and accurate results. Detect a wide range of vulnerabilities in all legacy and modern web applications, address security bugs at scale by automating the confirmation process, automatically prioritize vulnerabilities, and assign actionable tickets to the right developers in their native workflows for rapid remediation. For more information on how to scale application security with ease, visit securityweekly.com forward slash NetSparker. Welcome back everyone to Paul's Security Weekly. Security Weekly listeners save $100 on their RSA Conference 2021 All Access Pass. RSA Conference will be a fully virtual experience from May 17th through the 20th in 2021. Security Weekly will be live streaming Monday through Thursday in the virtual broadcast alley, interviewing some of the top sponsors and speakers for the event to register using our discount code. Please visit securityweekly.com forward slash RSAC 2021 and use the code, sorry, and use the code 5U1Cyber. We hope to virtually see you there. Fred Gordy is an industry expert within building intelligence data analysis for building control and power monitoring systems with an emphasis on cybersecurity. His control systems knowledge gives him insight into the challenges interlacing traditional IT environments with control systems for a cohesive and secure operational technology platform. Fred, welcome to the show. Hey, Paul, thank you. This is an honor and a treat. Uh, I've watched the shows before and uh, really good information. So thank you. Thank you so much, Fred. It's nice to have you here with us tonight. Fred, how did you get your start in information security? Well, many years ago now, uh, before 2000, I worked in uh, regular IT. So um, that was you know, I was beginning to kind of move up the chain, if you will. And then all of a sudden, I, I got a, a call from this company called Facility Robotics. And they said, we'd like to interview you. And I said, OK. I was looking for a change. And they explained to me all of this about building control systems and that kind of thing. And I said, something you probably shouldn't say in an interview. I said, are you sure you got the right guy? Because none of this made sense to me, you know? And they said, well, absolutely, because these things are beginning to get connected to the networks and then ultimately out to the web. And, and the building control system space really doesn't understand that. So we're looking for IT guys. So in 2000, I moved over to that company. And uh, guys, I got to tell you, it was like going into the Wild West because there was no standards. There was no practices. It was just whatever you wanted to do. And, and I'm not picking on the integrators because I used to be one. I was one for 20 years. But it was just enough information, or they knew just enough of how to put an IP address in a subnet. And that's pretty much it. After that, it was, you know, wide open to the internet. Hmm. It's really cool, Fred. I, w one of my, <laughs> I think, uh, kind of aha moments, I've had a lot of them in my career, <laughs> is when I, I was sitting down, and I believe this was with the team that was implementing building controls. I was working in a university, and this was um, a research facility that also had to house animals uh, for testing. I'm not going to pass judgment on whether you agree with that or not, right? But this is the cards that I was dealt. And the, the environment in the building controls were extremely important as to not harm the animals if we were to get you know extreme temperature in either direction. And I asked the question... Um, about like how it works. And they were like, well, we just want to know like what, what firewalls and stuff we need to put in place. And I'm like, no, no, no. Like I want to know how you use it and like how it 
works so that I can help you secure it. And it was like one of the first times in my career where I was like, well, one, I was really all about asking that question. And two, kind of it was shock and awe that I actually was asking that question. <laughs> like, you're the security guy. Why do you care about how it works? We only want to talk about like how to hack it and how to secure it. I'm like, yeah, but I want to understand your business function and how things work first. And that's what made me realize how important building controls were and kind of insights uh, into that. So I appreciate what, what you do, Fred, because it's there's a, there's a lot to a lot of these systems and very important for security. And, and you know, you're absolutely right. And, and but I got a, another piece to the story is um, after I kind of drank the Kool-Aid, if you will, we're mm. OK, well, whatever, we'll just do whatever. Um, th I was working with some pretty large corporations, uh, Fortune 50 companies and, you know, doing things like power monitoring inside of eight, uh, data centers for uh things such as billing but also too like when the loads if a load dropped and it would flip over to the other side you had to precisely monitor all that stuff mm -hmm. but what i noticed was even inside these environments it was totally separate from us they didn't mm. want to talk to us right. they did it, it was you know yeah here here's a range of ips go do this yeah that's what i got too yeah yeah it's, yeah and because so it's not i mean what we're talking about oftentimes isn't what we typically think of as industrial control systems. It's not yeah. the gas company, mm -hmm. the power company, the water company, right? These, right. This is different. This is uh, manufacturing or just like I said, any kind of building automation that may interface with power, uh, with temperature, with HVAC, with door systems. Fire systems. Yeah. yeah. Am, am I in the, right, in the right area, Fred? Absolutely spot mm. on. And, and an interesting story there is when seven years ago, when I started trying to figure out cybersecurity for this industry, um, I live in Atlanta and one of the uh, places here is Georgia Tech. Mm -hmm. So I knew they were doing stuff with ICS and I thought, well, I mean, that's pretty close to what we do, mm -hmm. right? So I go talk to them and they, they, tell me everything that they're doing. And I said, well, can I explain to you how building control system works? And can I also explain the culture? And so I did. And they said, you're right. Well, you're not an exact fit. Well, <laughs> that's not comforting because mm. now we basically, I'm working in an industry with, with no standards. Now we could build off of ICS and we did build off, off of ICS. We used NIST 853 mm -hmm. and the controls. But even when you start going through those, it's like, wow, there's 1160 some odd of these things, but only about 20% of them apply. So um, we started building a practice around NIST, also 62443, and trying to you know, structure it so that it would mimic that world, but also to take in the nuances of a building control system, because actually, with if you inject too many IT pr uh, processes in on it, you can kill one of these systems. And I've got stories of of that if you want to hear them later. But but it also I, there's you know it's interesting and I'm uh, actually kind of concerned that it, it's not getting enough attention because when we talk about cybersecurity, talking about ransomware and a lot of these attacks, <clears throat> it's not often that physical safety is impacted. Sometimes, sometimes. Right. But when we talk about building control systems, I think there's a higher degree of physical safety. Another example, when I was at the university, was the key card access system. Mm -hmm. Now, we in IT tend to think of that as, well, people shouldn't get into the data center. You put that in a university, like, people shouldn't be able to access a building for the safety of the students, right? And, and, and those were the more concerning things for me when, it, when I was at university, because I'd look at the you know, little card readers, and like I'm like, there's an Ethernet cable on there. I'm like, oh, where are those on the network, and what do they look like? And then the shock and horror when you lift up the covers, <laughs> as I'm sure you can attest to a hundred times over, Fred. Right? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, um, along that lines so of the 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 potential for um, life mm -hmm. life events, you know, hurting somebody. Yeah. Um, you know, we've we've had some situations that we've come in after the fact, and. You know, people say, well, did you find out who did it? Well, in my industry, audit logs are a, what is that? Mm. You know, so th there's, they're not stored. But anyway, the point being is we've had situations where people have gotten hurt. Uh, nobody's gotten killed. But we work with things like boilers and mm -hmm. uh, power distribution inside of data centers. 
And for example, um, this large company wanted me to figure out how I could get in and hurt them. And because I had spent my earlier career in data centers programming these systems, um, <clears throat> they had things in there called smart ATSs or automatic transfer switches. And then there's a generator sitting out in the parking lot. Well, if you transfer one of those, if you get the generators going and you transfer it out of phase, you can blow pretty much every breaker inside of that building. Right. And that I'm not the, talking that about- That was the Aurora experiment, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and we're not talking about you trip them. I'm talking about you frown. Mm -hmm. So it, we're, we're, I told the guy, I said, look, if, how long would it take you to rebuild these? And he said, it'd take us six months to a year. Yeah. So with doing that, I could shut down a data center in a matter of seconds. But yeah, it's, it's scary. Some of the, some of the attacks, you know, uh, very, Tyler, you mentioned the fire suppression, which is uh, one of my favorite scenes in the movie hackers, right? <laughs> Where he makes the, the sprinklers come on in the middle. I mean, I think yeah, every that, one of us watched I that. I thought that was, like, was the pool on the roof had a leak. Not the pool the on the roof had a leak. <laughs> I know that's the, that's I mean, the, the fire, thing. fire suppression systems are like, that's a, a fairly new. In fact, I just helped, uh, write one of the standards with, uh, NFPA uh, which is National Fire Protection Agency, uh, and they're just starting to get to the place where they're drafting a framework for cybersecurity. And, w I mean, this is at, like, alpha, alpha ground level, uh, but they didn't even think about this. This goes back to a conversation I had with one of their directors back two years ago, and, you know, they asked what I was doing, and I was telling them how I was breaking into a building, and I'd gotten in that night through the fire suppression system. Yeah, well, not they, only had that, never, tripping, they had never considered that. Tripping the Halon system when there's people in the data center is a bad thing as well. That's, That's really a bad. really bad thing. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, they don't use Halon anymore. They don't? Nope. CO2. Oh, yep. Fred, really? tell, us, tell, us about, tell us about that. Is it Halon suppression? Have you looked into it? Honestly, we've been so focused on the control side of it. I, you know, I, honestly, I didn't know they had swapped from Halon. I mm -hmm. yeah. thought they were still using it. Well, because, yeah, that's mm -hmm. not a control thing. That's a... That's a no. safety. It's a safety yep. thing, right? And there's right. differences. Yeah, exactly. Um, I do want to point out one other thing. You know, we did a, a, a an event here just recently to educate people what what the real world as it relates to um, control systems. We work primarily in the commercial real estate world. Most people don't know this, but there's 87 billion square feet of commercial real estate. My team and I have assessed. Uh, a couple of thousand buildings throughout the United States and Canada and overseas. And it's it's almost like we could write the report when, before yeah. we ever showed up because they're all about the same. There is no structure. So with that said, um, the, the bad guys are figuring out they can sit in these networks undetected because A, there's no audit, there's no trace, there's no vulnerability monitoring. Uh, so you can sit in there and if... The, if by chance, which I'll tell you this, I actually did this, is to put two NICs in one of the application servers. And so on one side, you got the control system network, which is a 192.168 flat unmanaged switches. The other side, you got the corporate network. Mm. So you could use this just to pass right on through. Um, but I want to go back to something on uh, sa health and safety. There's another aspect that I've been studying for the past five years is chaos. Uh, we live in a post 9-11 era and here's a real world example we had a uh, company that um, we did an assessment on and we're walking through the garage and there's the parking system and we said well aren't we going to check that and they said oh no that's that's not part of the scope and and they're on their own network and you know blah blah, blah. and i said yeah but you your name's on the building mm -hmm. and they said well we're not going to do it today Two weeks later, I flew back out there to, to meet the guy to go to another building. And he came up to me and he's kind of like sheepishly said, well, let me tell you what happened. And I said, what's that? He said, somebody found uh, the, the parking vendor had a wireless access point, little Linksys, you know, at default settings. Somebody got in and printed there's a bomb in the building. Wow. So now here's something that is a printer. It's not controlling anything, but... The chaos element of this yeah. in the post 9-11 is it kind of it could have gotten really ugly because when they after they quit saying, oh, it must be a joke and they had no incident response. Several hours went by. Then they called the police. The building was dumped for two days 
And but when people they started alerting people, there was no plan or anything like that. So mm. all you got to do is let them get crazy and run over each other. So yeah, I think a, a, a lot of us uh, hackers, when we think of building automation, it's not necessarily like a lot of the stuff I've seen that that I gravitate towards is the cool physical stuff, right? Right. Not necessarily the like I break in over the network. Like my two favorite examples recently are. Uh, the butter knife, if you've got a, a building uh, door control system that you can bypass with a butter knife. I love that because you can find a butter knife, you know, just any kind of object like that and bypass it. I think the butter knife is a great example. The other one that I love is the, what do they call it? A re, re-entry system? Re-entry re yep. detection. Re-entry detection where mm -hmm. you can use a can of air or in like Dave Kennedy's example, he took a hit from his vape pen and then blew it through the door and tripped the re-entry sensor and the door from the lock side opened up. And those yep. are all, I like the physical attacks are, I mean, the demos are really cool, right? But uh, for what you're describing, even in a parking system or whatever, the uh, effects from a network and uh, software attack are, can be mm -hmm. equally as devastating or yeah. more. You know, and, and this is the thing that also we've hired, you know, guys have come in who are traditional IT and work with my crew. And it's 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 a it's it's a really eye opening experience. For example, um, in IT, would you use a, a SharePoint server to check your Facebook account or Gmail? Probably not. In my world, it's you walk into a room and you'll see an application server that's uh, running the HVAC system, the lighting system, the fire system, everything is in on a desk. They're logged in 24 seven. Mm. And these guys look at them like their workstation. Yeah. And so we've seen a 600% increase in attacks and a hundred percent of them would have been or were avoidable because they were 80% uh, of them were phishing attacks where yep. they uh, encrypted the, the, the front end. In one case, it caused surgeries to be canceled for two days in 50 sites. Yeah, a hospital because the it was, the HVAC was connected to that yeah. PC? Well, what it is, is in the operatory suites, you have to have a certain pressure level mm -hmm. to keep the germs. But anyway, right. the, the, positive pressure. The, yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you can't monitor it, you can't allow <laughs> patients to go in there. Oh, interesting. And so there's, I, I've, it's interesting, Freddie, you say that because I've wanted the monitoring of my HVAC system for my home. Mm -hmm. Most home HVAC systems do not have, most don't have any, and some it might be very rudimentary access uh, to those HVAC systems. But when you get into commercial mm -hmm. buildings, it, essentially the HVAC is part of the network, correct? It's, it's that, well, and sometimes it is, and sometimes it's on its own. But mm -hmm. uh, you bring up an interesting point. You got to, you got to look at the, um, the, the importance of the two. So in, in IT, you have CIA, right? Confidentiality mm -hmm. is first, integrity and availability. In this world, it's flipped on its head. And since its inception, availability is number one mm -hmm. and primary with no exception mm -hmm. because these devices are all talking to each other and they have sequences of operations. And if they lose, if this one can't talk to this one, then it can't perform a function. The integrity of the data is also very important because you got to have the right temperatures and relative humidity and so on and so forth going back. Uh, um, confidentiality has been like off to the bottom and to the right. So mm. these systems, when you look at them, I've got a video that I put on LinkedIn where I show people how I can get into a system remotely. All I do is look on census or Shodan find what's called a BBMD, which is a BACnet Broadcast Management Device, and in 22 seconds, I'm inside the system with mm -hmm. no username and password because of the availab high availability. Right. And those, so. it is interesting, those monitoring points we don't often think about with an HVAC system, for example. I've had issues with my HVAC systems at home, and they, you know, you can buy these great smart thermostats like Nest right. and these other ones, and like, that's great, but it's it's just a thermostat. Like mm -hmm. it's not monitoring what's hap. I want to know what's happening in my HVAC system. I'm sure these other systems. Like I want to know the airflow coming in, the airflow going out. I want to know the water pressure, the water temperature, and monitor those points to look for any potential failures. The thermostat doesn't mm -hmm. give you that mm -hmm. that style of telemetry. For that, you need other systems. Yeah, why, right. baby? And what you're saying, Fred, <laughs> is that they're pretty much wide open in a lot of commercial 
They are. And in that I mentioned BACnet, I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but it's a protocol in my world and it's it was developed as a means by which multiple manufacturers could talk to each other because people didn't want to have to buy thick clients and, and be proprietary. I've heard they of that before. To... And so this is for things like HVAC and lighting and what else would fall into BACnet? Uh, BACnet is pretty much anything in the building, even um, there's elevator control, there's power mm -hmm. monitoring, there's uh, uh, water quality systems, yep. for example, in New York, uh, Legionnaires, you have to monitor that inside the central plant system. So pretty much anything is using BACnet now. And the thing is, is the, the very reason, you know, I said availability, right? Well, is if you bought a, a tritium system or a Honeywell system and you wanted to buy a component from Johnson Controls, well, you need them to be able to talk. Well, BACnet provided that and it doesn't require any kind of authentication or anything like that. So, and all of the information you need to get into any of these systems, especially legacy, is on the web because technicians needed to be able to, they show up on site, oh, wait a minute, I don't know what this is. So they get online and here's the default username and password, here's this, 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 and this, and you're in. And this coming from a protocol that was started the, the design process in 1987 and, you know, saw a huge uptick in 95. And the security impl impl implementations and how we thought about security back then was way different than it is now. Are you covering this in your class? Not back yet. Then? No, yeah. no, not now, yet. now he's noodling that's it, right? The, yeah. that's, the IC, yeah. that's the ICS class that covers that one. Yep. Mm. <clears throat> I am yeah. curious. Uh, I mean, are there, are there big pushes for, uh, I mean, I work primarily in like ICS, OT, and, and SCADA side where we're talking power and other things. Like from building automation, are we seeing some of the improvements like uh, like DMP3 where some of these oh. vendors are starting to utilize some of the more advanced protocols that then or, or Profinet or Profibus where you can uh, layer some of the security and add some of the availability through some of the industrial control protocols? Well, there's a couple of things. Is there's a, there's a body called ASHRAE. Uh, and don't I can't remember what the acronym <laughs> is right off the top of my head. But inside of there, there's a working group called the Secure Backnet Working Group. And that's what they're, they're working on building and what they've actually built it. It's a secure backnet protocol that has a lot of layers and encryption and everything. But there's also other devices that have come along. Uh, I don't know if you guys uh, heard of F5 uh, way back they kind of splunk, sprung over to this company called Temper Networks. And there's some other ones. But anyway, it's they build zero trust networks without having to change the device IPs or anything like that. Because basically, you're using what's called host identity protocols so that the device you have to tell which device to... It's kind of a whitelist kind of thing, but it's mm. more than that, if you will. Yeah, I've seen similar uh, technology. Yep. I want to welcome Joff Thayer uh, to the show. Hello. Hey, Joff, it's good to have it is, you. It is good to be here. I, it, I it's just lovely to be here. It's been a, it's been a little while so. Yeah, it's, a hot minute. it's good to be back. We're talking building automation security uh with our guest You, you know, Gordy. It, this whole conversation takes me back uh to my university yeah, years as right? well. I know Paul and I mm. have dealt with this before, but you know, I actually built them an entire separate uh layer 3 even now and just isolated the whole thing I said because I was a network architect. Time I said, look, you guys have that that pool to play in, and you can talk whatever you want to talk, and I'm not going to implement any security, but you're not talking to the internet, right? That's it. <laughs> Just yeah. put it off in the now there was some obvious uh, challenges with that uh, for updates and things like that, but uh, it it was a pretty effective strategy. What I found is when it you seems when like you did that, Joff, is that especially you know 20 years ago or so, people would connect an actual modem to a phone line. To, to get yeah. remote access. I don't know right. how common they, that they still is today, but in it. building automation, I'd imagine it's more common than we think. Not anymore. Mm. Uh, yeah, yeah, now it's just cellular anymore. modems. The mutation of internet is <laughs> much, much more now. But but the idea of having a separate little uh, separate network and that you control the security and dedicate it purely to that network was is really the way to handle it because if you put it in a shared network with a corporate network, there's no way you can actually deal with it. Mm-hmm. It seems like a great place where zero trust is starting to come into play, where you still have some of that availability. You have some conditional access control, uh, mm -hmm. but you're adding those layers of authentication, whether they be you know validly uh, 
uh, set up or configured, that's kind of an entirely different conversation. Well, exactly. you know, you know the interesting thing, um, and that's actually good, that's a good comment. Um, and the other thing, the other thing I ran into a lot, and th- this is now you know fifteen years ago, but you know, the the uh, that was made about uh, the operator sharing the server as a regular workstation was absolutely applicable. We ran into it all the time, and of course, when I put them on their own network and separated it, the biggest complaint was, well, now we have to buy another machine that we can use as a workstation. I right. said, well, you should have done that in the first place. <laughs> So anyway, stuff happens. Fred, is that is that is that changing today? Given that the cost of a PC has come down so much, is there a a, a bigger movement to separate you know the workstation from the control systems environments? We're pushing it, um, but honestly, there's so much resistance to change because mm. look, you got to understand these guys have worked in this little bubble with nobody telling them what to do. And their job, their job is to make the people in the building comfortable and productive. And so they will do whatever it takes to get people off their back. So with that said, um, anytime you touch their networks, change their configurations, it's like, I don't know, it's like you called their baby ugly or something. But you're absolutely right. And that's what we tell them is, look, let's go lock this thing up and get yourself a couple of hundred dollar workstation yeah, right <laughs> it's, it's easy and and like i said all of these attacks that i talked about earlier could have been prevented if you'd have done just that are there vendors or certain systems that are either more vulnerable or more secure than others fred or there's pretty much a kind of like a a medium where everything's pretty much at the same vulnerability <laughs> level or are you seeing some vendors and systems emerge that you're like, oh, they're actually doing it right. That could be a model for how we do this. So a couple of things is the manufacturers themselves have, have really stepped up their game and they're they're putting security in the system. But you, there's pieces of the puzzle, the manufacturer, then there's the integrator and mm-hmm. the end user. Well, the integrator is way behind because they, they you know, their, their thing is they want to install a, a system with as least cost as possible, as fast as possible to make the most profit. Who can't blame them? So, inter- they see these, uh, inter- uh, you know, enabling these security features and doing all these things differently. That's an added cost to them because it's time. You got programmers on site and they have to re- configure things, which, in my opinion, it's once you get your, uh, what we call a control profile set up for a device, it's 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 pretty easy. You just do it the same way every time. And then the end user is pushing back towards the integrator and the manufacturer is saying, hey integrator, you got you know got to kind of come up. But then the the kind of outlier here is your facility management guys who had this symbiotic relationship with the the integrator because right. o- over the years it's like, hey, you put this new computer system in, can you ma- can you set up my users? Can you do this for me? I got to tell you a story. We got a call one time. This guy uh, called our service department. This is when I was working for uh, an integrator. And they said, our control systems. They called and said, the control system's gone. And they called me and said, the service people called me and said, what do we do? And I said, hey, it's not gone. So I sent one of my guys out there and he walked in the door and, and he was a good troubleshooter. He said, what do you mean your control system's gone? And the guy pointed at the desktop and he said, see, it's gone. And he said, Justin said, let me look at something. He looked in the recycle bin. Somebody actually deleted the URL shortcut. For- mm-hmm. That's, they don't want to know. Not saying mm-hmm. that the new guys coming up are, 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 are learning, you know, I mean, they know computers. So... It sounds so also similar to the AV space. You know, we do a lot of research into AV equipment. And I was, I, I think at the top of the show, before we started broadcasting, I was talking about, we weren't, we're trying to order new teleprompters uh, for the set. And the the one we have works on an iPad. And some of you have been probably listening for a while, have probably heard us curse our, our teleprompter. And then when the show starts late, likely it's because we had issues with our, our teleprompter. So the first one I order, they say it's discontinued. Like after weeks, they're like, finally, like your order's canceled, it's discontinued. And then, so I find the new one, which is of course more expensive, but it seems to work. And I'm like, well, what are the requirements for the PC? And when I read the FAQ on the manufacturer's website, 
they say it requires a Pentium 3 or higher computer. And I, I paused for a moment and I made a guess and I said, Pentium 3 is like early 2000s. Turns out that was February 1999 that Intel introduced <laughs> the Pentium 3. And then I'm looking at some of the uh, videos on their website and it's showing like Windows XP. Like here's how you get our software running on Windows XP. I think this is something you probably deal with on a regular basis, Fred. <laughs> 100%. I'm well, not 100%, but it's funny you say that because like one of my guys sent me a clip, I mean, yesterday mm. from out of a spec, and it was basically along that line. Right. So what they're doing is they're just copy and pasting out of a library. Right. They're not looking at it. So they you, know, you don't know that. And then um, the but but the whole thing about XP, let me say this too, is our re, our life cycle of these systems, you know, the, the manufacturers I was talking about, they're coming out with new stuff, but that doesn't matter. That 87 billion square feet of commercial real estate, do you know that probably most of them have at least one system in there that's 15, 20 years old, um, mm. maybe more. So, <clears throat> and they don't want to change it and they don't have, they haven't had a, a business case to change it. Right. You know what I mean? So it's still a Pentium 3. Was Windows XP around in the early 2000s? I think it... Uh, yeah. When was I XP? So. I think it was XP at that time, right? It was like 90, 99, 2000 that it started to really get out. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And it's but, amazing we still have the... I mean, because you don't normally see like NT or 98 <laughs> or anything really in the Pentium kind of uh, age, but you might see XP. It's right? all about the Pentiums. Yeah, mm -hmm. we see a lot of XP. <clears throat> yeah, I bet in a lot of control systems. Why? Why is that, Fred? Why do we see so much Windows XP in this space? Well, so you know, I talked about around the early two thousands and when they this rush to connect everything to the network. Yeah, and there was Windows two thousand, and then it went to XP within I don't know a couple of years after that, and so everybody were was buying these systems to control their building. And so, like I just said, they may hold on to them for 20 years. Yeah. Well, that's why you see it is because they had a system installed. There was there's no policy around updates or anything like that. Mm. But, so why why do anything? But I, I bet you, Fred, that that stuff still works, right? If you it bought does. right uh, 20 years ago, you bought a, a, a PC <clears throat> and any kind of like card reader. You mentioned parking lots, like those kind of electronic gear, it's probably still running just fine, and they haven't had the need to really mm. have to upgrade because it still works. Well, I went and yeah. did an ass assessment in a, a building and the guy, the building manager there, I said, I need to see your elevator. And he said, uh, your elevator head in. And he said, I don't know where that is. <laughs> let's call, <laughs> let's call the, uh, uh, the vendor. And so the vendor really was like, well, it's not connected to the net internet. I don't know why you're, <clears throat> it's not even connected to a network. And I said, I still have to see it because we also look at the operational risk. Mm hmm so we walked in the room and i see across the, the room the elevator head in which has this massive box with all these home runs back to it from the elevator controls windows nt wow and i said yeah. man if this machine dies you're gonna have to rip out your elevator controls you're gonna have to right. get you a new you know because the the software now won't run on nt yeah so, and and find a machine that'll run NT, you know? Did it still have think, like I a monitor? Wait, did it still have a monitor from back then? Like a big CRT monitor? No. Yes, it did. Yeah. Oh. Yes, it did. It was working. Oh, yeah. I mean, it had some burn in. Sure it yeah, yeah. Lots of burn in. Yeah. Wait, wait, yeah, yeah, the yeah. image was burned. In the screen. Yeah. I, I was going to say. It may like, have been off and it just looked like it was on. <laughs> right? that's, that's even better. Mm. I was going to say, I, yeah, that, we that, did some clean out the other week and I think I just threw out a couple of Pentium 4s and maybe even a Pentium 3. Right. Like, I think I even have a couple of. Uh, uh, Pentium, single Pentium uh, laptop sitting That's in my vintage. barn somewhere. That's vintage. You could probably sell you know, it to you know, somebody just, in you, control. Yeah. You, mm. you just reminded me of, I, I did an assessment on uh, on a skater network, a water treatment plant uh, years ago now, but it was XP in all the devices and it was like not even service pack zero. It was just like pure XP. Uh, so, so vulnerable. Uh, but the funniest part about that story, and I have to tell this briefly, I said, uh, I said, well, you got a wireless network here that you guys are using for the internet. I said that, it, that you know, tell me that that's not in common with the uh, control network, right? Uh, and, and the guys were like, uh, no, 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 we, it's. Amped. I said, well, c can you show me that? 
<laughs> I can't even say this without laughing. Mm-hmm. They took me to the closet in the back, and they said, you see this Ethernet cable? I said, yeah. He goes, well, at 5 o'clock, we unplug it. It's our aircraft. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Son of a... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, it's not the same thing, but I mean, just the way that the mindset is, what you just described is the mindset that, I, that I'm dealing with. Yeah, it is. I did a, a military base, which were name, main nameless. Um, and there were, I went into, uh, I was supposed to be, go behind this integrator that was putting things in and check his work. And the very first building I went into, I walked into the back and the guy's over there. He's got his laptop plugged in and he's working away. And I look up and I got a picture of this. I use it in some of my presentations. There's a picture. There's a device that has two NICs in it. It's called a JS8000. And it's hanging on the wall. And I see two network cables. Well, I knew this system was going on the nipper net. And if, I, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the nipper net, but that's, mm-hmm. you know, it's it it's not the I'm securest, not. <laughs> but, it, but it still should be secure, right? And that other cable. So what is this? And he said, oh. This is so the guys back at the office can support me. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, we have a DSL modem out there and, and, and public IP so that they can a public IP and you got it strapped to the nipper net. Mm. Well, they're not they're not the same <laughs> network. I said, you can traverse right across. Unplug that now. And that's what they had been doing. Yeah, that's scary. <laughs> well, fortunately, it was only nipper net, I mean, not zipper just... net. But yeah, yeah. yeah zipper net would have been. <laughs> Uh, I don't even know. It, but it's, it, you know, it's not, it, well, I think what we're describing is kind of the perfect storm. It's mm-hmm. older systems that were purchased when everyone wanted to be connected. It's running older software, running on older hardware, and the other peripherals that are connected to it are very resilient. There's mm-hmm. also a culture of, well, it works and this is how we do it because this is my job and this is what I do. And there's also a remote access component to it. it and Fred, it kind of seems like in, in talking this amount of time, this is like the perfect storm for really well, bad things to happen. <laughs> well, it is. And, and you, I, I wanted to, I'm glad you brought that up about remote access. You remember I was talking about this symbiotic relationship with the integrator and the facility mm. guy. So when the things got connected to the network, the integrator said, hey, man, if you want to be able to check your system on the weekend or at night or if you get an alarm and you don't want to drive down to the building, I can help you. Right. He's like, well, what do we do? Well, I just you just need to get a DSL modem and we'll, we'll you bring it in and buy a block of uh, public IPs. We'll stick it in for you and then you can check it remotely. Oh, and hey, by the way, if you have a problem and need me to come check it, I don't even have to drive down here. Mm. So. It's a feature. It's a feature, exactly. Mm-hmm. And in yeah. fact, Sold. service <laughs> service contracts are written around the fact that I don't have to roll a truck. Yep. Work from home before work from home is cool. Mm-hmm. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Problem is, everybody else can work from book, home. Too. They'll, they'll, they'll secure it. Don't worry. A four character password on it. It'd be, it'd be fine. <laughs> One, two, three, four. <laughs> exactly. Mm-hmm. exactly. And, so. and of course, we all know about the water treatment plant using Team Viewer. That's another prolific thing in my industry is the vendor has installed TeamViewer. It's not the customers. The customer has no control of remote access. The vendor does. Mm, interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And there, Many there of those service that. contracts rely yeah. on that though, right? Like even, yeah. even in ICS and OT environments, like as part of, say something like a Siemens deployment, as part of your contract to keep your maintenance and uh, support updated, as well as the continual support agreement, that's written in that they have to have that remote access and they control it. They control the software, yeah. they control the, the licensing, they control the access. Exactly. And when I ask an IT guy, I said, would you allow somebody to have that kind of control? And they're like, no, no way. But, and there's no audit trail. You don't know who's come in. So. Yeah. And so. you mentioned logging, Fred, e- even yeah. with uh, building access controls for doors and stuff like that. Uh, Mm -hmm. I thought most folks would keep a copy of those logs to know who badged in and badged out. Is that? Well, they do a better job on on those systems for sure. Um, Mm. And and you have the database that resides out at the the reader. And then, of course, the database back at the head end. So those, I will say, 
from an access standpoint of swiping your card and coming in, those systems usually have a pretty robust mm. audit trail. But it's the logins to the application that, I mean, you know, you can even, I mean, you can monitor the logins to the machine, but there's an application running in a Java engine that the machine doesn't see who's logging into that. Right, right. And th so different levels of logging. Right. Uh, th th we had a customer who had 1,500 buildings and they had an employee who was very trusted and he got fired and in a bad way. So they immediately started ripping his user out. Well, the system that they started ripping his user out required a username and password for that machine to machine communication, which had uh, data transfer and control. And when they did, they lost over 100 buildings, con con communication and control to 100 buildings. And it took the manufacturer 6,000 man hours to get them back online. Oh, oh what? Wow. What? That is, yeah. that is bad crazy. all the way around. It's yeah. just ugly. And it's bad so, practice. Why would you use a person? You, the, the way that it should be is there's a, there's a username and password at that level that nobody knows except an admin. And it shouldn't be one of the users of the system. Yeah, I mean, IT seriously. still makes this mistake by using users instead of service account or managed service accounts. Mm -hmm. And, you know, yeah. people leave and then those service accounts are tied to something. Yeah, that's it's oh. it's, it's just all about practice. Tragic. So what it's I'm, tragic. <laughs> what, what I'm wondering is, you know, we've got these systems that have been playing in place for 20 years that were set up probably before. Uh, the IT organization was even able to provide VLANs to, set, to do segmentation and stuff. And I'm wondering, given what we know today, how much improvement is actually happening versus leave it alone, it's not broken, don't freaking fix it. I will tell you that it's, it's, sl it's slow right now. Yeah. Um, the, the, the Fortune, Fortune 500 companies, they're, doing, they're being pretty aggressive, but then the commercial real estate it's not, I, I, I'd be afraid to give a percentage, but it's very low of the ones that are changing. Um, but the thing about it is, I mean, I just keep coming back to these people have to have a business reason to change and they have to, and the facility got, people have to be good with it because you can bust sequences of operation that, you know, that control that mm -hmm. building's heating and cooling and, 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 create a nightmare if you don't do it right yeah is that is that business reason eventually probably going to be a catastrophic event that is caused by something like a you know an attack well what yes uh <laughs> and and we're trying to educate people but i also i, I want to mention something there is a group that is working to create standards and um even a certification process but and I'm actually on the framework committee. We meet. We call ourselves the Breakfast Club. Every morning at seven o'clock, we we're we're beating up the the standards. We're using eight hundred fifty three, uh, six two four four three, and twenty seven thousand and one, and we're building that. And I'm the little wet blanket over there because I'm the only building guy. And they start talking about all this, and so oh, you can't do that. <laughs> but anyway, is this what this group is doing we're actually now working with a large insurance group and that insurance group is is working to come up with a way by which if these building owners do certain things they get a uh, they get a reduction in pr uh, premium so there's your business case yeah there's a there's a lot of insurance agencies out there well i'll say there's a few big insurance companies that are doing very proactive things around security because they see a the risk they know that something is going to happen eventually, and they've already right. seen a huge uptick in you know ransomware and what they're paying out. Uh, once this translates over to other things, like that incentive is you know that's easy easy investment money for them. It is, and and another thing too, I mean this is on a much smaller scale for sure. Is I can tell you that whenever I'm stuck in front of a building, portfolio manager or whatever, and I just tell stories, because I, I, I got a bunch of them is and i've got the verification to back it up and i tell them you know like the bomb in the building well they lost tenants because there's a, a, a when you when you rent out a space like that especially in a class a building like this you expect you know comfort control but you also expect security right mm. 
this this happened so they they had two government agents on the in the building they did not renew they had several different high value tenants that didn't mm-hmm. renew and so they saw the cost benefit of you mm. know doing this and so but like i say when i tell these stories um there's a little bit of that ah, this can't be real and then you know, people start checking my, you know, they start checking my stories and it's like, yeah. And they, and the other thing I hear a lot is, well, why aren't we hearing about these? Like you do all this other stuff. And I said, because you're not by law, you don't have to report these. You do if it's credit cards or healthcare or whatever the case, or like in ICS where mm-hmm. it, if a, if a pipeline were to get hacked or something like that, but a building, you don't have to report it. Yeah. Fred, I want to hear some of your other stories about building like what, what's the weirdest technology is it like a, a lighting system or like what, what what are some of the stories can i tell an it story first please do it's not a hack um we work with this um large media company let's leave it at that um <clears throat> the building was over 100 stories high and it had over 10,500 devices inside of there wow. to run this entire thing. And so we went in and did the cyber commissioning on all the devices. Everything was finished. We turned it over, uh, said, okay, we're done. Two weeks later, I get an email and it's an all call from their head of enterprise security and saying everybody needs to be on a call. <clears throat> so I knew the head pretty well and he said, he started off, um, he said, well, we've had a situation and we don't know what, what caused it. And that's what we're going to get to the bottom of it. He said, over 60% of our devices got knocked offline. Like, you know, and so he looked, he started talking to me. He said, did you get, were you and your guys scanning? And I said, yes, we were. And he said, we're well, in there a problem with scanning these devices. I said, yes, there is. <laughs> And uh, I said, but we finished two weeks ago. Mm. Oh. And so I'm, I won't bore you with all the details, but what turned out to be is they had run a Quala scan <clears throat> and it knocked them all off. Well, qu- these devices thought it was a D- DOS, mm. you know, because they, they can't handle that. Well, the funny thing is during the call, once we figured out what it was, uh, in their data centers above the, the racks were these little things that monitor power. Well, the, there are 2,000 of those or 2,500. And the guy that was the vendor for that, he said, look, we're going to go in and reset these things. But in order for us to reset them, we have to climb up a ladder, pull power, plug back into them, plug the power back in to make sure that none of the settings got knocked out. Now, if that happens again, we're going to give you a laptop, a serial cable, and a, a ladder. And you can do it. Wow. <laughs> so it that one was about a 1.25 million. Wow. So, but uh, there, one of the worst hacker stories was there was a guy, I mean, a company that the guy clicked an email on the application server and he noticed that a few things were weird. It, it, I don't know what that means. They were explaining it after, after the fact to us. And he said, just a few things were weird. So he backed up the system. And it's like, okay. Because they had, oh, that's another thing. In this world, backups are pretty much a afterthought. I mean, what it, backups? It, yeah, what backups? Or they back up to the machine <laughs> that needs to be backed up. Right. Uh, but anyway, so so he backed it up, and a little, uh, and what it was was there was an email had said, oh, uh, they're getting more crafty. They're sending things that look like facility kind of stuff, like mm. it comes from Johnson Control and so on. Anyway, he said to his buddy, he said, hey. This email you sent me, the link in it, it didn't go anywhere. And the guy said, I didn't send you an email. Mm-hmm. And then he said, oh, okay, good thing I got that back up. Well, a little bit later on, she Shit. walks in, and you know what he saw on the screen, right? So <clears throat> it was every, they had gotten ransomware. And so they said, we got a backup. So they called the vendor in. The vendor came in, uh, wiped the machine clean, put a new, new copy of, of probably XP, um, mm-hmm. and then reinstalled the backup and got the system back up running. Well, later on that day, they noticed there's the VFDs or the variable frequency drives were running up and down, just <clears throat> abnormal. Something wasn't right with them. 
And these, the chiller plant in there, there were two big chillers and they swapped. There's a Monday rotation that a lot of buildings have. So if you got two chillers, you don't want one to run all the time. Mm. And they swapped and none of them had done it, but there's like, but they're so used to weird things happening. They don't pay attention to the right. law. And these were, these were HVAC systems? Yes, yes. Mm. So big they, chill. they, huh? I said big chillers, big, eight, big chillers, big. three, 300 tons. Mm -hmm. Big yeah. ones. So they, so they go home, everything, the buildings, you know, pretty much unoccupied at night. When they come back in the next morning, it's, it's really warm in there. And so they start looking and on the head end, a bunch of their controllers in the central plant were offline. So they go down there and look and they tried to restart the chillers and nothing would happen. The long story short is that the VFDs were, half of them were burned up, but they found that the uh, VFD uh, safety overrides had been killed. All the alarms had been disabled. And, um, I don't know if you're, you're probably familiar with the term cavitation. The pumps mm -hmm. had uh, apparently cavitation had occurred because some of the pumps were all pitted and messed up. Wait, so, so they had, sorry, explain cavitation. So it's best way is you're running stuff in and out and the, and the, the flow through the system is not consistent. These chillers are mm -hmm. pretty, you got to, you know, once you get it going, you don't want it to back up or anything. Gotcha. So w once that, once they figured out that they had to replace several of the pumps. Then they had to tear the chillers down to make sure there was no problem in them. And this all took them 92 days. So what we figure happened was when they wiped the machine clean and it came back up online, it pissed somebody off. And and the thing I've been telling people for years, I, I'm a programmer, I program systems. I program pretty much most manufacturer systems that are out there. One of us is going to go bad. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, my job now is to figure out how to kill your building. That's what I do. So I, I'm doing it from a good point of view. So there's got to be somebody. And this, you don't just, I'm not saying some guy that didn't had never seen a building control system couldn't do this. But you got to know that the VFDs, you got to know where the emergency overrides are. I mean, there's just too many things. But I just think somebody got mad mm. and just wrecked the system. I don't know. That's scary. T Tyler. That's a great that's a great quote. Yeah. Somebody somebody's gotta go bad. Yeah. Mm. And Tyler, don't piss off the hackers. Don't piss <laughs> off the hackers. We come back to this every week. Yep. Yeah. We'll but it, but it's hackers. interesting. I, you know, I, I think one of the qualities of hackers is to be able to learn a system if you have to, right? Is to be able to go, hey, I found the system. I'm gonna go find all different ways to find out everything I can and then yeah. I'm going to sit there and I'm going to threat model and figure out how I'm going to hack that. But that takes time, right? That's yeah. just not someone that's like, oh, hey, I landed on this system and look, it controls this thing. And, you know, they plug into the matrix or whatever. And it's like, oh, now I know that. Like, it takes time and they have to do you learn think it. That's a reason, do you think that's a reason why we haven't seen more of these attacks kind of in the wild? Well, I mean, we're seeing them. Um, I'm not going to say that, you know, we've got a... A quiet period right now but we we see at least a couple of months mm. so i mean i think it's i think and that's just us so i gotta and and also too you know people we believe that there's a lot more that's happened but they just fixed it and moved on yeah that happens a lot in this field i would agree with you fred i saw that a lot at university too there are certain yeah. incidents it building control systems are not where we just we, they fix things and i'm like I don't know that like that could have been someone with malicious intent or not, but like we may never know. Well, it's like maintenance's job though. They just show up and they fix it. And they fix it. That's right. Not, it's no not their job to do. No they, they're not incident responders. They're maintenance people. Their job is to get it back and running. But the other scenario that I'm waiting to happen, or at least it probably has already happened, but every one of these vendors usually have um, a single username and password that all their technicians use yeah. and they've used it for years. Well, I'm waiting for one of those technicians to get fired and pissed off. Mm. So you're waiting for the solar winds of OT and building automation to happen. <laughs> but that, you know, his, historically, Fred, that's that's usually the case. If you go back yeah. to uh, phone system hacking, a lot of the System 7 stuff, a lot of the VMS systems all had those default uh, accounts. And even in their own verticals, even if they took something like VMS, for example, and changed all the passwords, 
for whatever application that was in business, those would always be the same across all of their clients. Now, hopefully mm -hmm. when they deployed it back out to their clients, that password was changed. But one of those implementers is going to get owned one of these days. And that implementer is where like outside of the PLC vendors and, and their software solutions, the implementers is really where I see a huge, I mean, that's where we've done a lot of threat modeling is, is almost a supply chain through the implementers and their yeah. inability to change or address their security problems. It's interesting. There is, and Fred, you talked about it, right? There is that supply chain where there's yeah. the manufacturer, there's the integrator, and then there's the, the client. And what's interesting is when I worked for a lottery company, we kind of, we didn't, we rolled a lot of that into one. We were the integrator and we had oftentimes an office where we sat, if it was a major lottery system and we sat there and we customized everything. So we'd buy the hardware from, uh, you know, DEC at the time or Sun Microsystems. We would do all of the integration and help with the maintenance and, and management and security of it as well because it was a lottery system, right? And there was that, yeah. it's interesting, a different mindset of like, there's a lot of financial uh, risk involved with a lottery system, of course. Mm -hmm. But when we think about building control systems, we don't often gravitate towards that. Although you gave some great examples during this uh, this segment, Fred, where it can have a significant financial impact. It can, and and mm -hmm. and you know the thing is, inside when we do an assessment on a building, we have a standard set of questions that we ask, and and the, those questions score on an algorithm that we, you know, back end calculations mm -hmm. that we created. But one of the factors in there that I insisted that we put in was a weighting based on how much it would cost to fit to, to mitigate it and then how high of a value of, of target how high the, the targets were in there in other words who would want to get who is this somebody people would want to get to right and 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 the thing about it is when you start when there's like this dawning that happens with these guys when we come back with a report and start going through everything it's, uh, I had a guy tell me one time, he says, we don't really have any high value people in here. We just have a bunch of law firms. Mm. <laughs> wow. Mm. And I said, okay. <laughs> but I mean, you know, I mean, it's, it's an education. I, yeah. I feel like a lot of times I'm a teacher. Right. In a way. Yeah. Cause most, most of the threat model like we do as hackers, right? It's just not human nature to want to believe that people would do those kind of nefarious malicious mm -hmm. things. No. That's kind of our role, right? Yep. Exactly. Right. Don't don't assume malicious intent to begin with. Well, maybe you should. Maybe you should. I don't know. Fred, Depends. we just have uh, five questions left. Uh, oh, boy. You. you ready to play five questions with Security <clears throat> Weekly? Because Absolutely. I'm ready. Three words to describe yourself. <laughs> um, oh. this, can I say two? Yeah, sure. Sure. Never satisfied. If you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? Uh, icicle. If you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? Unsettled. What is your favorite hacker movie? Matrix. Really? See, I thought you were going sneakers because there's a lot of building automation hacking and sneakers. Me too. I called sneakers 100%. <laughs> right? I was like, what I was like, is it's this? definitely yeah, entered sneakers. If you would have said guys, TV show, I would have said Mr. Robot. Yeah. Every time I see somebody uh, hacking a building control system or something like that, it's like, uh. Yeah, it's not. <laughs> but yeah. Mr. Robot came pretty close. They did. There yep, was the Raspberry Pi thing in one of the episodes, did, right? Yep. That was a good one. They, yeah, uh, I, I, they did a really good job, and we knew some of the folks that did some of the tech, the tech yeah. stuff. Yeah, um, cool. Mark Rogers, tech consulting. Uh, yeah. I think yeah. Mubix did the, some. Uh, he was for was he for a different show for some other stuff. Mike Bazell did, yep, did Mike, some of it. Yep. Yeah, but a lot of, a lot of people folks we, we know, know in the industry. Yeah. Absolutely, the tech advisement for that. So there we go. Good stuff. Fred, choose two celebrities to be your parents. John Wayne and Lucille Ball. Oh, oh look at he doesn't even need to. Uh, uh, what was that? Say it again, Fred. John Wayne and Lucille Ball. Oh, oh damn. Yes, I like the John Wayne one. Classic. Yeah, yeah, that's nice. Awesome. Well, see, you get that a mix. You get Mr. Serious and Miss Comedian. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Fred, thank you so much for appearing on Paul Security Weekly. Well, thank you guys. I mean, this has been a pleasure. I, I really enjoyed it. 
a lot of fun. We could probably have you here for a week and tell stories. And talk, and yeah, talk <laughs> about this kind of, we love this kind of hacking, especially. Yeah, absolutely. I'm ready to come back whenever you want me to. Thank you All so right. much. That was Fred Gordy, Director of Cybersecurity for Intelligent Buildings. Uh, coming up next is the security news. Stay tuned. <laughs> 